by way of review, as we've been going through the Old Testament, we have seen Israel's family of 75 been transferred by the Lord from the land of Canaan, the land that he has promised to give to them, down to Egypt to develop into a mighty and multitude of a nation. You might say that Egypt is the womb in which this embryo of Israel develops. Well, we're getting to the part of Israel's pre-monarchy history. We have finished up the patriarchs and we are looking at the Exodus. The Exodus refers to God bringing that child nation out of the womb of Egypt and into the land that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them as an inheritance forever. Now, what happens just before a woman gives birth? Her husband goes crazy. I like that. End of sermon. Ah, the craziness starts with all the wonderful things that she says to him while she is experiencing labor pains. Now, I want you to think of the ten plagues, because that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, as the labor pains before Israel comes out of Egypt, before the nation is born. So we are indeed discussing the Exodus, when God takes the nation led by Moses out of the land of Egypt. Now, the Exodus, as I said last week, is going to be discussed in a couple of parts or a couple of sections. The preparation for Israel, preparation of Israel for the Exodus out of Egypt. And Exodus is a group of people, usually a very large group of people, that move from one location to another. And after that, we're going to look at the preparation of the nation of Israel for entrance into the land of Canaan. Now, the preparation for the exodus out of Egypt began with the people. This week, we're going to look at the plagues. Plagues, for those of you who don't know, are just really very bad things that happen. Sometimes they are diseases. Sometimes they are disasters like storms or supernatural events and then we're going to look at the Passover and then the plunder so how did God prepare his people one word trouble trouble he took Israel's family and put him down in Egypt and I'll tell you it was heaven on earth for a while it was Joseph was alive. The Pharaoh thought really well of Joseph and his family. And they gave him the best part of the country. And they gave him all they needed. Well, that Pharaoh died. And uh, another Pharaoh came who did not know Joseph, didn't respect the Israelites. And he enslaved the Israelites for how long? 400 years. God gave Israel trouble for 400 years as a way of preparing them for the exodus. How did he prepare Moses? Trouble. Moses got into trouble and he had to flee the land of Egypt. And for the next 40 years, he's a nobody pastoring sheep for his father-in-law in the Midian desert of Sinai. So God prepared his people with trouble. Now, how do we know these things didn't just happen to them? You know, you know the bumper sticker that stuff happens. Well, this didn't just happen. How do we know? Do you remember the psalm that we read this morning? Let me call attention to one of the verses. This is Psalm 105, verses 23 through 25. Then Israel, who's Israel? Israel was Jacob. Jacob and his family, Israel, came to Egypt. Where? From where? From the land of Canaan. Why? Because there was a famine. And Joseph is down in Egypt. He's the prime minister. So Israel came from Canaan 
down to Egypt. Jacob, who is Israel, sojourned in the land of Ham. Does anybody remember who Ham is? No, he's not one of the Dr. Seuss characters, Green Eggs and Ham. Ham was one of Noah's sons. One of Noah's sons. He was not the good son. Ham did something awful to his father. And Ham's son, Canaan, whose family settled in the land of Canaan, uh, were cursed by God. And Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. But did you know that most of Africa is also known as the land of Ham because Ham's relatives also settled there. And Egypt is in Africa. And the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes, you remember? And the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and there became more and more and more of them. Anywhere between one and three million people dwelling in the land of Egypt. He, who's that? God, turned their hearts, whose hearts? The hearts of their foes. Who are their foes? The Egyptians, to hate God's people. Who are God's people? Israel, to deal craftily with his servants. So let me just translate that for you. It was God who made the Egyptians hate the Israelites within their borders. God was the one who turned their hearts to hate his own people. And folks, remember that. You can be having a great relationship with somebody, a husband, a wife, a, a child, a parent, a friend, and all of a sudden, this person turns on you. It may be from the Lord. It may be his way of getting your attention. Hey, you are not following me. You need to start paying the attention. And so God was doing this with the nation of Israel, preparing them for something better. So if God loved his people so much, why would he give them trouble? Folks, just think back to your own experience. Most of us were saved at a time in our lives when things were not going well. God got our attention. We tried everything to remedy our problem. And finally, we had to acknowledge that we were in the mess that we were in because of sin. And that none of our efforts at being good or being religious was going to take care of that problem. And we turned to him to plead for his mercy and for forgiveness in our lives. God loved his people. He gives them trouble to get our attention and to remind us we cannot save ourselves. We are not the solution to what's wrong in our lives. We are not the solution to what is wrong in this world. I hate to bring it up because it sounds so political at this point. But this striving and this rush to get a vaccine for this COVID-19 stuff is just reflective of human nature. You just give us long enough and we collaborate we can cure whatever is wrong in this world. And no, you cannot. Because for every disease that you seem to cure, more will pop up in its place. And trouble is just a way of reminding us that the only real cure for what is wrong with us personally and collectively is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Moses was reminded of this as well with trouble that he himself could not deliver Israel, at least not without the Lord. All right? The people of Israel groaned under their bondage and cried out for help, and their cry under bondage came up to God, and God heard their groaning. Trouble is a way of reminding us that we need God, 
And what did the Israelites do? They turned to God. And they poured their heart out to him in their groanings. Trouble does no good if you refuse to accept that you need God. All right. So here we are. The ten plagues. The ten plagues. All right. First up on the plagues. Put your rod in that river. And it will turn to blood. The Nile is the lifeblood, if you forgive the reference to blood, of the nation of Egypt. If the Nile turns to blood and all the tributaries that connect to it and the ponds and the puddles turn to blood, what are the people going to drink? And so for seven days, they didn't have anything to drink and they were digging along the Nile to try to find water because they couldn't drink anything in the Nile. And what do you think happened to the fish? The fish died, and sure enough, it stank because it was blood and because you got a bunch of dead fish. And that's not all. You know what else lives in the Nile River? Crocogators. I'm sorry, crocodiles. I forgot where I was. Now, the crocodiles didn't die because they've got enough sense to get up out of the river. So now you've got a double problem, a triple problem. You can't drink anything. The fish are dying, so that's going to affect your income and probably your diet. And now you've got a bunch of crocodiles crawling up out of the river, tormenting people near the Nile River. And it is not a good thing. And this is the first of the plagues. What's the second plague? The second plague is frogs. Frogs. Frogs came up on the land, out of the Nile, from everywhere. And people were inundated by these frogs. And they were everywhere. In the houses, in the palaces. They got in people's ovens, it said, and in their kneading bowls. You're, you're making bread, and you're thinking, man, there's something moving in there. What is it? It's a frog. Now, when we were kids, we used to like to go to little frog ponds and collect as many of these things in a bucket. And you know what? When they're alive, they stink. How do you think they smell when they're dead? Because you know what happens if you step on a frog? It croaks. I didn't say that. But imagine going to bed at night and you crawl in the sheets and, you know, the frog's there to sleep, but he's not going to hold still. And he's uh, crawling all over your legs. Who's going to sleep while these frogs are around? Frogs everywhere. And then they start to die. And they said they shoveled them and piled up in great heaps. And once again, the land stinks. All because of sin. Next, next up, your Bible may translate it as the plague of gnats. Well, the Hebrew word is a little obscure. And it could refer to any small insect, including a mosquito. You've heard me tell about these backpacking trips. So one time when we were up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, we were camped near a place where there were no streams of water. And we walked about a quarter of a mile down the road, or down the path, I should say. And there was a swamp. And we were desperately in need of water to drink and to cook with. So we had to get the water out of the swamp. And we had to put chlorine tablets in our water bottles and let it take effect for a while. But in our water bottles and buzzing around our heads were more mosquitoes than I have seen in my entire life. They were up your nose. They were in your ear. They were in your clothes. And when we got back to camp a quarter of a mile away, a lot of them followed us. And we were eating mosquitoes that night in stuff that we were cooking around the campfire. Well, imagine a plague that is a million times worse than that all throughout the land of Egypt, and this is plague number three, gnats or mosquitoes. And folks, if it's mosquitoes, 
there's a lot of scratching and itching. They're in your eyes, they're in your nose, they're in your mouth, they're in your food. They are in everything. The next one up is the plague of the flies. Flies all over the land of Egypt. We had this phenomenon in Vermont because most of the houses are old and not very airtight that we called cluster flies. You would go to one of your windows and there would be no fewer than 100 flies just sitting on the glass of the windows. They are all lethargic. If they land on you, they go thump. And you can take your fingers and pick them up and toss them off. They, they don't fly very well. Every day or every other day, I would get the vacuum cleaner out and clean a hundred flies off of every one of my upstairs windows and have to empty the vacuum cleaner bag just because of these cluster flies. Well, imagine flies not just attached to your windows, but everywhere, in the air, on you, on your animals, on your children, in your food. That is the fourth plague. And the one after that is a plague, some sort of disease that killed all of the cattle and the camels and the horses and the sheep, the livestock. This ruined the economy. Not only that, what do you think about the smell? And think about this. You got buzzards coming, eating the flesh of these animals and other scavengers like hyenas or coyotes or some dog type of thing, anything that'll eat flesh. So you've got dangerous animals approaching and the stench of all of this is going up throughout the land. People are probably starting to get very discouraged. There's a handsome fella. You know what the next plague is? It is the plague of boils, boils. And it, does, it doesn't just say boils, it says loathsome boils. Because you know what happens to boils? They break open, and they bleed, and they fester. And Job, what did Job get do when he had all those boils? He took something sharp, and he was scraping the boils on him because of the itching and the scabbing. And this is a more pleasant picture than one I could have posted up here on the screen. Awful, awful torture to human beings all throughout the land of Egypt. And these boils often will leave permanent scarring and disfiguring on your body. Next up is hail. Now, you guys have all seen hail storms before. How long do they last? Just a few minutes, sometimes just a few seconds. I've seen hail pile up as high as five inches in the course of 120 seconds when I was in North Carolina. People were sliding off the highway like they were in a blizzard or a snowstorm. And I was just laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing I had ever seen. But imagine hail that goes on for days and does not stop. And guess what it's doing? Any buddy or any animal that is outside of the house, it is killing them. And there's, it gets worse. This hail is mixed either with lightning or some sort of fire. It is absolutely terrifying. And so we have yet another plague. Locusts. For those of you who don't know what a locust is, it's just a fancy name for a, a specialized grasshopper. And these things uh, today, I, I looked this up, they will swarm a country in the Middle East as much as 400 square miles. That's, that's how big their swarm is. Now, that's not all that big. Sharon and I live about 20 miles from this building. So if you do a 20 by 20 square, you've got 400 square miles, okay? Imagine something as big as the state of Alabama. 
because that's just a small section of Alabama, 20 by 20 miles. But this is covering the entire land of Egypt, which is seven times the size of the state of Alabama. Now that's a lot of locusts. Who can produce something like that? Our God can. But what do the locusts do? They eat everything that's green. So if you've got boogers, no. If you've got plants or leaves on the trees, they're going to eat it. And they don't move on until they're full. Lots of locusts. The next plague is the plague of darkness. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been out in the woods miles and miles away from any city whatsoever. And I've been out there on a cloudy night where there are no stars or moon shining. And guess what? You can still see. But this darkness was so bad, this plague of darkness, that they couldn't see anything at all. They couldn't see each other. They couldn't see their hands in front of their faces. And to make it worse, have you ever maybe been walking through the woods or someplace at night and you didn't know that you were close to a branch and you felt the leaf on the back of your neck and it scared the daylights out of you? Well, the Bible says that this darkness was something that you could feel. Imagine the terror of not being able to see anything and that feeling all around you. I don't know what it felt like, but it was physically feelable. Imagine the terror and the loneliness. And finally, the tenth plague was the taking of the firstborn. The taking of all of the firstborn within the borders of Israel. Egypt, from Pharaoh all the way down to the slaves. Now, let me take a view of these plagues from a different point of view. Who caused the plagues? Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. And who is the God of the Israelites? He's the only God that is. All of the gods in Egypt are made up gods, invented to explain things. And Yahweh is showing his power as Yahweh, and he's showing the lack of power of any of the Egyptian gods. Let's, let's briefly go over these. The Nile was changed to blood. Now, do you remember that the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, said, huh, you can change water to blood? We can do that too. And by their magic occultic arts, somehow they changed water into blood. Now, did Israel suffer from this plague as well? Yes, they did. Now, who was this plague aimed at? This was aimed at a couple of Egyptian gods. Knum. I don't speak Egyptian. That's just my pronunciation of that first one up there. And who is Knum? Does he ride a canoe? I don't know. Do you? I'll tell you what he was. He was the guardian of the Nile. And if he's supposed to be guarding the Nile against anything bad happening, where was he? How come he didn't stop Yahweh from doing this? And God shows his superiority over Knum. How about Hoppy? Hoppy, he's the spirit of the Nile. When he's featured in drawings, he has a crocodile head. But guess what? He was not Hoppy at all about this. And he could not do anything about what happened to the Nile. And the next plague was the plague of frogs. Did the did, uh, did the, uh, the magicians, they were able to duplicate that too. Oh, you bring frogs up on the land? Watch, we can do that too. Somehow through their demonic or satanic influences, they're able to bring up frogs themselves. And Israel, Israel had to go through this plague as well. And this was an attack on the goddess Hecht, who was often featured with a frog's head. 
Real pretty goddess. I don't think she knew what the heck was going on. But there wasn't anything she could do about it. And God, Yahweh, showed his victory over that goddess as well. How about the gnats or the mosquitoes? Now, when you get to this point, the magicians look at Pharaoh and say, hey, we can't duplicate this. And you know what their words are? This is the finger of God. They recognize Yahweh's power. Okay? Does this also happen to Israel? Yes, they have to put up with the gnats or the mosquitoes. And this is an attack on the earth god. Because you know how this was initiated? He struck, Aaron struck the dust of the earth. And it became gnats and mosquitoes throughout the land. And Jeb is the earth god or the god of the land. And he wasn't able to keep this from happening. Next up is the flies. And none of the other plagues can be duplicated from now on. And now with the flies, God makes a distinction between his people and the Egyptians. And from now on, God says, only the Egyptians are going to experience these plagues. So Israel was scot-free on this one. And this is aimed at the god Uachit. Okay? Uachit says when, when he appears, he often appears as a fly himself. That's how he manifests himself. Now, where do flies tend to gather? There's two places. Dead animals and piles of manure. Hence this God's name. And I won't go any further with that one. But the next, the next one is the, is the attack or the plague against the livestock. Not duplicated. None of Israel's livestock dies during this plague. You would think about time, about now... People are starting to get the message that Pharaoh would start to get the message. There's no stopping Yahweh. And your gods are making no headway at keeping him from doing whatever he wants to do. And there are three gods in Egypt, Apis, Hathor, and Menevas, who were drawn to look like bulls. They were very prevalent gods, and there were three of them. And you can see the leftover, the carryover, the residue of this sort of thing. In that while Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and the people made a god to represent the god that brought them out of the land of Egypt, in what shape did they fashion it? In the shape of a bull. Okay, so that's a very prevalent god in Egypt. They failed to keep Yahweh from destroying the livestock. Next up is the boils. This is an attack on Isis. You guys have heard of Isis. You know, on the back of the dollar bill, that pyramid, and there's an eye in there. That's the eye of Isis. Isis' husband was Osiris. And Osiris was murdered. A god who can be murdered. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And Isis kind of raised him back from the dead. Why? Just so she could have a child by him. All right? So she, a healing was attributed to Isis. What could she do about the boils? Nada. Zip. Nothing. Hail. Hail. No hail in Israel, in the land of Goshen. This is aimed at the god Nut. Nut. Boy, I'll tell you, if I were the god Nut, I would change my name. And Nut was, was the goddess of the sky. Where does hail come from? The sky. What, was Nut on a vacation? This Nut case could not prevent Yahweh from doing what he did. And you know the most remarkable part about this, and I can't get this from the scriptures. This is just my guess is that this hail probably came on an absolutely cloudless day, just to show that this is really the power of God. The locusts, do you remember how the locusts came into town? 
through an east wind. An east wind drove them into Egypt. And this Amun guy, guess what he's in charge of? He's in charge of the wind. And he failed to keep the locusts from invading Egypt. And the next one is darkness. Darkness. Guess who Ray is? Doe, a deer, a female deer, Ray, a drop of golden. Ray is the sun god. Where's Ray throughout all this? Come on, Ray. Shine, Ray. Shine. Nothing. Ray couldn't do anything about the darkness that Yahweh had brought in to the land of Egypt. And the firstborn. The firstborn. They couldn't duplicate this, but why would they want to? I have a blank there where Israel is. Because Israel could have been susceptible to this plague had they not obeyed God and taken the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorposts. But this is aimed at Isis. You remember I told you Isis resurrected Osiris. Which was to explain the springtime of the year when everything became green and fertile again, and hence we've got eggs and bunny rabbits. And the offspring of that relationship was Horus, her son. And Horus was sent, said to physically manifest himself in whoever the Pharaoh was. So this plague is aimed kind of at Horus and Pharaoh himself. And nobody could stop what Yahweh did to the firstborn. All right, now let's take this collectively. Satan's servants duplicated some of the plagues, the first two. Yahweh did that? Hey, we can do that too. Now, tell me this. Did they cure the problem or did they make the problem worse? You know, that's... <laughs> That's like somebody coming up and slapping my wife. And I'm saying, that's, that's not a good thing. And I go up and slap her too. <laughs> Does that make any sense? I just made the matter worse. And that's all that Satan's servants did when these plagues came along. They were no solution. They just added to the plague. Now, how come Israel got to experience the first three of these plagues? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, to sit back in the stadium and to watch some quarterback get tackled by the three biggest guys on the other team, and you can say, whoa, like that. But unless you've experienced some of that pain and pressure, you have no idea. And God wanted Israel to experience some of his awesome power. As if to say, you know, you guys aren't any better than the Egyptians. Not only that, why should we Christians be exempt from the trouble that plagues other people in the world? We shouldn't. But there's a limit to that. It tells us over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe it's verse number 10, that we were not destined for wrath or for tribulation. God draws a line when it comes to us, and we will not experience his ultimate wrath. Okay? And so God eventually exempts Israel. Now, as these plagues are going along, imagine that you are an Egyptian. How is your confidence going in the gods that you worship? Man, that's going down. How about that leadership that you've got? Pharaoh, who keeps stubbornly hardening his heart, saying, I will not let these people go. I am going to resist Yahweh. How did that work out for him? But how did it work out for his people? Folks, you think that you resisting what God obviously wants for your life 
is just a matter that pertains only to you. It does not. It affects everybody who knows you or is close to you. God showed his power over all of nature and all of the Egyptians' gods. So God had a few purposes for the plagues, but I'm going to address only one, and that is to show Israel his power. To show Israel his power all over all of nature and all of mankind and over all the Egyptian gods. Now, why is that important? Because God wants to bring Israel into a land flowing with milk and honey. And who is in that land right now? A bunch of very, very, very evil people who are worshiping other gods. People that are more numerous than the Israelites. More battle ready than the Israelites. And they are very, very large in some parts of Canaan. And the Israel spies said, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. And God, through the plagues, reminded them, not only that he is with them, but that he is able. He has power over all of nature. One battle that Joshua fought went on for a long, long time time more than 24 hours because God interfered with nature he has command of everything and he gives us the victory and those gods in the land of Canaan were not able to deliver the Canaanites from the Israelites because God showed his power over them and he's giving them a preview of what he's willing to do for them by showing his power over the Egyptian gods. And friends, it's the same with us as individual Christians and as a church. God wants us to be a light to the world. And you may feel, I just can't, share the gospel with my friends and my family. But you can because you're not alone. And the God who commanded it is also with you. And he is able. Father, thank you so much for showing us your power. And the gospel is the power of our God for salvation. And nobody is going to get saved unless they know the truth about why Jesus Christ died on a cross to be punished for my sins. And that God raised him from the dead to show he's done pain for my sins and he accepted his offering for my sin. And I will ever love him and follow him because I am grateful. We thank you in Jesus' name.